You are listening to Mind Pump, the world's top-ranked fitness, health, and entertainment podcast. And this episode, we answer fitness and health questions that are asked by listeners and viewers just like you. By the way, if you want to go through the episode and watch where it's timestamps, you can fast forward to your favorite parts, go to mindpumppodcast.com. But what I'm going to do is give you a breakdown of the whole episode. So we open up with the introductory portion where we talk about current events and things in our live. That's 37 minutes long. We started by talking about reality TV. Is it real or is it fake? Hmm. Then I talked about my wife's journey to the DMV. Oh, so frustrating. Yeah, purgatory. We talked about the new Mir insulated coffee cup. They're amazing. It keeps your coffee warm or keeps your cold beverages cold. It's really nice stuff. By the way, you get a discount through Mind Pump. Just go to Mir.com. That's M-I-I-R.com forward slash Mind Pump. Use the code Mind Pump for 25% off. Then Adam tells us about his... Spotify Joe Rogan conspiracy theory. Ooh. We talk about the importance of teamwork. I talk about Larry Wheels on Instagram. He's so strong it doesn't make any sense. It's silly. We talked about the fighter, the UFC fighter, uh, Adesanya, I think is his name. His gyno. Apparently he doesn't know where it came from. We think we know where it came from. Weird. Where's that come from? I talked about a new study showing that fasting causes muscle loss. And then we talked about our pumpkin spice lattes made with Organifi's pumpkin spice gold juice. No sugar, tastes great. It's got adaptogenic herbs mm. that balance out the caffeine. Great stuff. By the way, Organifi makes lots of organic, amazing supplements, and you get a good discount because you listen to Mind Pump. Here's what you do. Go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash Mind Pump. Use the code Mind Pump for 20% off anything on their site. Then we got into answering the questions. The first one, this person, when they go on vacation, uh, they find that they lose a little weight, they feel better, they digest better, they get better sleep. What's going on? Why does that happen? The next question, this person wants to know what are the best priming movements for squats, deadlifts, bench presses, and overhead presses. By the way, if you want to learn how to prime your body for free, go to mapsprime.com. It's a free webinar. Next question, this person wants to know what we think of kettlebells versus dumbbells. And the final question, this person wants to know what it was like when we first became personal trainers and how to deal with imposter syndrome. So long ago. Also, look, we create fitness programs accessible online. You go online, you sign up for one of them, you follow the workout, we demonstrate the exercises, we tell you what movements to do, how many reps, how many sets, what the phases are. Uh, you can check all of these programs out at mapsfitnessproducts.com. We have created programs for almost everyone. So based on your goal, your experience, go on mapsfitnessproducts.com. Find the program that works best for you. Follow it for a full 30 days, no risk. In other words, you don't have you can you get a full refund if it doesn't blow your mind. So there's nothing to lose. Follow the program, and we promise you'll see some incredible results. Again, it's at mapsfitnessproducts.com. You've all, you've only been once, right, Justin? You haven't gone back? No, yeah, just once. Do you guys plan to go back again? Yeah, I'll probably go back. Um, but if it's Borat, I'll go. Yeah. yeah. When's the release on that? 23rd. Of this month? Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. I'm excited for that. It'll be funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They had to, I mean, they he had to have shot that fairly recently when you look at because the he, t he talks about covid in it yeah yeah he talks about covid and he's got this uh where he went he goes to some like trump rally and and talks to mike pence and uh yeah like so he's he's up to his same shenanigans where he's dressing up and like trying to be incognito so some of that's got to be pretend though well yeah I, like, of course you, like staged you know some of it yeah but i also i think that they they position it like uh, you, they try and find people that don't really recognize them and probably, you know, like it's some kind of documentary and don't tell them exactly what it is. I'm sure some of it's like that. Yeah. It, so remind, it, yeah, it reminds me of, it reminds I, me I of those. all of it is. It reminds me of maybe. Well, most of it is probably. Probably because it's like those magicians on TV when they go up to the street, the people on the street and show them their magic and they're like, how did he get the card inside the apple? Yeah. <laughs> probably an actor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. What I mean? Hey, act like you're just a dude on the street. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm a so dude like, on the street. Yeah. 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 Oh my God. You, how did you get the card in my pocket? Whoa. Yeah. I yeah. remember. Mind when, blown. I remember when someone spoiled that for me. I think I, I think I met somebody uh, back in, God, it was, 
early or mid 2000s when I met somebody who had been on. What are you like, like? You were in your 20s when you figured out was it wasn't real magic? No, not the magic. <laughs> the reality TV. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, when I realized that reality TV isn't so reality. All reality TV. Yeah. They, yeah. They, they, there's a producer that literally stages it, and then they have to wear the same clothes the next day if they didn't get all the shots. Oh, they or they'll yeah. tell them, "Hey, we didn't catch that. Reenact it. Can you yeah. guys talk that's about they, that again? That's what they feed told them me. more booze with uh, um, Ben Zorn. No, way oh. before him. Way yeah. before him. So like uh, they would, they were telling me that that on uh, Real World, right? That's sorry, I couldn't think of the name there. Uh, on Real World, they would you know film them all day, and if there was any sort of beef, they would totally stage. They would set them in the same room. They would tell them, you know, ask him this, tell him that. It would be completely staged. Or if they like you said, they missed something. They would make them reenact it so they can. Plus, now you know you're being filmed, you're doing it again. Yeah. And now you had time to think about the stuff you want to say. Yeah. It's going to be more dramatic. Of course. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. But the original Real World was real. Like the first season. That's why they got along. If you watch the first season of Real World, they pretty much got along, hmm. you know? And, and every subsequent season got yeah. more dramatic and yeah. worse. And they tried to cause drama, right? Of they course, got like dude. everybody like yeah. <laughs> in there had, you know, pretty dramatically different backgrounds. Yeah, dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the guy Puck or yeah. that guy? It's, oh, yeah. it's interesting to me that like most people know this now, right? But yet we still we would rather it be produced and you know, staged drama than just allowing people to be. Why do yeah. we like if drama? If it's too real, I feel like people get uncomfortable. Isn't that funny though? Why do we like drama so much? It doesn't make me feel good. No, I think it does. Yeah. I think no, it makes it, you feel good about yourself. That's oh, uh, like everybody remember, else is dealing with. Remember, some remember crazy how I told shit. you? You know my whole thing, right? When I'm sick, like what mm. I watch, and I, I'm, I'm trash TV. Yes, I'm certain that I've tapped into why because I feel so bad. Like there's not very many times in, in in my day or in my life period where I sit and feel sorry for myself, except for when I'm really sick. Mm. If I'm really sick, it, it, it puts you in that victim role right away. Yeah. Where you're like, oh, poor me. I'm so oh, I feel terrible. Right. So when you feel like that. Watching trash TV makes me feel better all the time. Do you go online and look up like, you know, horrible stories of people, you know, like oh, people worse than me. No, uh. just <laughs> 16 and pregnant does it. I mean, that's enough for me. I mean, yeah, that's, an, that's enough. I know because Courtney is like really into hoarders and like oh. those intervention shows, you know, I'm like, oh, I like, I hate watching Dude, those. have you guys ever It's got to make you feel good though about like, you're like, oh, my kitchen's kind of messy right well, now. Well, yeah, that's what she <laughs> says. I'm just like, oh, this is like, oh, oh, like who lives like this? Have you guys ever known a hoarder, like a real hoarder? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, I had a, I had a, a, st a staff member once and I went, to, went over his place and it was so shockingly like terrible, so disgusting. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. How do I explain it? The sink was full of dishes and paper plates. There were cans everywhere. And cockroaches. The, yes, dead cockroaches. Dead animals they just uncover. Like, <laughs> like, oh, that's where all the fluffy went. You yeah. were, every step was in on the floor because it was on something else. Yeah. And I remember thinking like... I I yeah, I didn't say something because I'm like what do I say? Yeah. You know, it was pretty bad. I always uh, wonder what never the, actually what the, in. the progression of that looks like for somebody. Yeah. Like does it just start off like you leave your t-shirt one day on the floor and you're just like, oh, I'll get it tomorrow." You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> it's just then a you, domino. Yeah, the, exactly. Yeah. Then you have dishes and you're like, oh, "I'll get it tomorrow." Yeah. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And before before long it's like everything is all over the place oh. and you're buying you're buying like new dishes because well, all your dishes are dirty. Yeah, I, I had like a little glimpse of that like living with these dudes that were like just disgusting human beings, you know. Like I, I don't, I couldn't even believe I lived with them for like a year. But uh, like, you talk about the big football player, yeah, big football player dudes that were just like just overweight and disgusting, and just would sit there and just eat food and fall on them. And they'd just let leave it there, you know. And I walked in, and, and dude, they they'd stack plates into the uh, into the uh, kitchen, and I would like wash them and i'd wash in there and i'm at a certain point i was just like i'm not washing dishes for them anymore let's see how and it just kept stacking and stacking and stacking and so it's i just like started a game of chicken i just put it i just one day i just took it all i threw it all away and they're like what are we gonna do so they started taking tupperware on the top of the lids and like eating shit off of that oh my god and like it like there was no end to their disgusting behavior i had oh. a roommate like that i had a roommate that was like that and it got to a point where when he finally moved out and he cleaned out his room, like, dude, he had like pots and pans like underneath his bed and shit. Like Whoa. we, this we were, he was a, a trainer and you know, we were one of like the go-to meals. We used to do uh, the, 
uh, hamburger helper, you know, boxes and and use ground but use ground turkey for the meat and stuff, and then that would be like a massive, you know, fifteen hundred calorie meal with like a hundred grams of protein. That was like a staple thing that we just made like every night. Mm-hmm. And he must have had like three, four pans of where he'd eaten straight out of the pan like that, and then just sitting in his bedroom, like in a closet under his bed, just like what the what Ugh. the fuck, dude? Yeah. Like at what point do you wake up and see a pot like a, in your in your bedroom and <laughs> I think, go like I'm just gonna get that later? I yeah. think you get to a point it's where it, you probably get past a certain point where you think it doesn't matter anymore. You're like, mm-hmm. well, it's already so disgusting. I might as well just. Take yeah. a shit right I here. don't think you ever think it's disgusting, or else you wouldn't have allowed it to happen in the I first place, right? I don't know. It's a, you know what they say? They say that you're, you're like numb to it. They say that your space somewhat will reflect your internal Yeah, like how you space. feel about yourself almost. Like your internal turmoil. So yeah. there's like normal messy and normal disorganized, and then there's the kind that is, you know, like yeah. real dysfunction. Yeah, yeah. Well, those shows have the opposite effect on me. I'm like immediately going around cleaning the shit out of my house. You know, if I, that's on TV, I'm like, ah. Oh. That's when they go into the house and they're wearing like hazmat suits to clean up their house. Is, yeah. that, is that what you're talking about? Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh my God. Have you never watched that before? I have. I've watched that show before. I have, but it's hard for it's hard for me to watch that. And it's hard for me to watch the, what's that show? My 600 pound life. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Courtney lives that. Of course. She loves that one too. It's really hard for me to watch because I feel so bad. And then it's also like, it's baffling to me. You yeah. know, like, I mean, it's kind of fascinating on some level. You're just like, wow, the psychology there, and like, how did this happen? I mean, we're all psychologically twisted, you know, in some way, shape. I mean, humans are just weird and be- to begin with, but yeah. at that level, it's it's really hard to comprehend. Yeah, anyway, speaking of uh, of <laughs> hilarity or whatever, poor my poor wife, she uh, she went to the DMV to change her name, right? Because he got married in, in February, mm-hmm. and um, so she's like, she's ready to go and ready to have this baby. So she's very pregnant. And the DMV is just a wonderful example of yeah. What is she doing at DMV it's just, right at this time right if now? If you dude. ever want to, if you ever think to yourself like, man, we should have government do more stuff. Go to the DMV because that'll be a good <laughs> yeah. a good reminder of why you don't just to find forms and fill them out and then go to different uh, locations within just one building. It's just a wonderful example of uh, just complete inefficiency and redundancy and archaic balloon. It's just insane. So she goes there and she gets there early because she's like, I need, because you go to the DMV, you're mm-hmm. going to be there forever. So let's get there early. Yeah, it's, line, it's purgatory. There's a line out the door anyway before it opens. So she's like, fine. She's waiting in line and she's got all the stuff she thinks she's supposed to have. And first of all, nobody, nobody offers her a place to sit. Nobody has her move in front, which really annoys me. You got a pregnant ass woman. Like, help. Anyway, so she's standing there. Right. She's already being cool about it. She's like, well, I'm going to do this. Finally gets to the front of the line, takes hours, gets up there, and they're like, sorry, you need this extra form, so why don't you come back again another day, right? Oh, it's so no. the DMV, bro. So she goes, so, and remember, oh, she's- Oh, you didn't know that? Yeah. yeah. So remember, she, <laughs> I know, I just, she's like, I got everything the website said. No, nah, it's not, you know, you got to have this yeah, other Yeah, but thing. also, yeah. So she gets support, you know, because she's obviously a little hormonal, right? So she gets in the car and cries. <laughs> she oh, texts me and she's like, I'm point. crying right now because- So then today- she goes there, and now she has everything she thinks she's supposed to have again. Okay. Everything. Okay. Mm-hmm. Gets there even earlier, still lying out the door or you know, in front of the building or whatever, waiting, patient. And I'm texting her. I'm like, you all right? You sure? Whatever. She's like, yeah. She's like, this is a good practice. She's trying to be like higher minded. Oh, she's yeah. like, this is a good practice you know, for my awareness. <laughs> I'm being really mindful right now. Being yeah. very mindful. And you know, I don't mind waiting. And you know, she's really good about that. She's very, very good about uh, reframing you know, ch- frustrating situations, but yeah. whatever. So she gets to the front of the line. She has everything. I remember she left early. She doesn't get good sleep right now because she's ready to have this baby. So yeah. she's tired. So she's right. basically got out of bed, made it over there. She's got everything. Finally gets to the front of the line. Oh, awesome. You, you know, Mrs. DeStefano, you have all the paperwork. Now we're going to take your photo for your ID. And she just got out of bed. Like, she didn't even. <laughs> so, she's like, what the fuck? <laughs> so she texts me. She's like, oh, no. they just took my picture for my ID. That's going to be on my ID forever. <laughs> yes. And I just got out of bed. No pregnant as hell. <laughs> she's oh, not God. alone. That happens to like almost uh, everybody. I know. You know, why, you know what? I was just thinking about as you were telling this story. I'm like, you know, if, if the, the third party candidate in, the, in this, uh, 
election right now, that they would be smart to just run on fixing the DMV. I bet you that could, <laughs> that could bring everybody. Why has that not been? Right, the other uh, two guys policy. are, are yeah. dividing the country, right? They're dividing that's, the country. That's right their now. campaign slogan. Yeah, yeah. I'll fix the DMV. I'll fix DMV. That's it. That's I'm going to claim I'm going to do anything else. I'm yeah. coming in for We're four years. Put a halt to everything else. I'm fixing the DMV. I guarantee you would get a good portion of the country oh, man. Yeah. to vote for you just for We're, that alone. Oh, finally, somebody's yeah. addressing yeah. the real yeah. needs. I'm not going to address anything Trump or Biden are doing. I don't have the time for that, but I am going to fix the DMV. Yeah, forget yeah. the economy, forget yeah. foreign affairs. <laughs> yeah. You're going to wait 10 minutes in line at the DMV. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. 90, yeah. Yes. You can do it from the comfort of your house. Yeah, they just won 90% of the vote <laughs> yeah. you know, for this whole thing. Oh, they man. would, though, right? It's yeah, so frustrating because you go in and it's like the most redundant. I'm like, why are you using all these staplers and photocopies and sending me to 15 different <laughs> windows? You go use the Scantron over here you know, to, to take your I test. How, and oh, I wonder how much money you lose just on uh, that. The microfiche to look things up, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah <I just> <laughs> <say>. <laughs> it's like the oldest shit you've ever yeah, seen. The, the, I'm going to need you to fact. The little this. tag that you yeah. have to pull out, right? The little yeah. number. I'm number D four seven five. No, we just went back in time. I'm in 1985 right now. <laughs> yeah. Wow, look at that computer. That's the first. <laughs> that's the first Macintosh even their, one even ever. Their Apple two e. are old. They use the old school yeah. computers. It's like Oregon trails on this? <laughs> yes, bro. Yeah. And then the th- people working there. I'm sorry if they're you angry. There. They're angry. Well, I mean, wouldn't you be? Yeah. Just like. Ugh. Yeah, <laughs> just hating oh, life. Worst dude. job. Ever. Just so mad. Ugh. Yeah, but they can't fire me, so I'm just gonna be. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna make this did, face the whole did time. Did you guys see? Oh, there was this hilarious like uh, article. Out, uh, I don't know if it was the Daily Mail or something like that, but um, basically, uh, I think it was in the Ukraine. Um, but they caught on camera, so they had set up for this nature. Um, video footage to catch like, you know, Siberian tigers and all kinds of stuff in their natural habitat and everything. And what they caught instead was a guy that was butt naked on LSD crawling around like he was a tiger. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. They were just like, oh my God. Like, and he apparently he had traveled like 15 miles in uh, throughout the, the, this forest area that was like heavily like shut up yeah like just butt naked just like just out of his mind he's having the time of his life <laughs> right like sounds like such a great time i would rather if i was in the, if i was in the wilderness and i'm like sur- you know like going deep in there and i'm like okay got to be careful for wild animals yeah i would be way more terrified of a naked dude crawling towards me right if you a, saw that you're camping than a yeah. bear <laughs> what the fuck he's scratching on your tent <laughs> 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 like, like no hey justin look out the tent and might be a bear. Let's, yeah. We got to be careful. We don't want to. No, get it's a bear ass man. <laughs> yeah, dude. Hey, speaking of <laughs> naked crazy man. Speaking of camping, I was. You know what blows my mind is how af- effective those mere camp cups are. I put my coffee in that camp cup the other morning. It must have been. I think it was like six in the morning. Maybe even no five thirty in the morning. It was like five thirty in the morning. And I didn't, and I drank like half of it. Set it down inside the studio. Didn't even pay attention to it. Came back to it at like two thirty in the afternoon. That shit didn't feel like it dropped a degree, dude. It's yeah. the it's the vacuum sealed it's crazy. Uh, what is it? The insulator that they put in there. Yeah. So, Super effective. Uh, Super. And so you put something cold, hot, whatever. It's like that the whole time. Yeah. Well, that's Hours. what's great too. Even with the cold, because like we have that that the water machine working again. Uh, oh, yeah. Finally, which you know now we, it is literally Arctic cold uh, when you go to drink it, even when it's like blazing hot outside. Yeah. What's the deal with cold water? Why do we like it? Oh, you know what it is. I think this might be what Just bring down your core temperature. Uh, yeah. But here's my but, theory. I'm gonna yeah. here, here we go. Okay. Put, here we go. Put my lab coat on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your, your tinfoil hat. Welcome which to South Science Quarter, <laughs> where right. he just speculates. Um, so I was thinking about this, like, why do we like cold water more than room temperature or whatever water? And like, especially Jessica, she's pregnant right now. She loves cold water. So this made me think, I'm like, what is it about cold water? And you know what it is? If you're in nature and you find cold water versus warm water, it's more likely to be clean, right? Because cold water is running. Yeah. Yes, it's running. It's less likely to be stagnant, like bacteria-filled garbage. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, well, do we talk- does that make sense? No, it does. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. I think that's a, a pretty. Yeah. Good. It's not sitting would, there stewing. I want know, that little star with, with the rainbow thing. The yeah, more you know. Yeah, <laughs> that's a de- decent theory. <laughs> that's stupid. Did we talk on here about? I know we t- we brought up Spotify and and Joe Rogan. Did we talk about how much did we talk about that on here on like the theories on what's going on? I I saw the guy on Barstool Sports. The, what's the hilarious dude that does the, oh, one, the minute, one minute? Yeah. Yes, the one minute guy. Man, he was breaking it down, and I and he did his little tinfoil hat thing when he started talking about this. But I subscribe to this theory. I do think that this is a a plot for advertising. 
Mm. I think like he, he makes a point. Just which, to get more attention? Yes. I do not think that Joe Rogan and Spotify get into contract with each other and don't discuss content and whether it will be censored or what you can and can't say. There's no, we wouldn't do that. If Spotify yeah. came after of us. Of course, that's the that. first thing they talk about. That's the very first thing. We want to know what we're going to be capable and we don't, we want control of our show. I don't care how much money you pay us. If you're going to try and say you're going to dictate the message, totally. no way. Yeah, right. totally. He's always been very so, protective of Exactly. That. So Joe either protected those or gave those rights up. And we, I don't think he gave those rights up. And so what I think we're seeing is four or five, like probably employees acting a fool and then Spotify being smart and being like, oh, you know what? Let's run with this story mm. yeah. because it's going to go all over the place and which it is and everyone's sharing and talking about it, which is just going to draw more attention to Spotify. That's that's plausible. That's a plausible conspiracy theory. Totally. You could go even further and, you know, because, you know, the world is run by the Illuminati. So maybe they're <laughs> yeah. they're trying to prevent him from revealing the yeah, truth. No, really Since we're going down lizard, the conspiracy. Yeah, let's know. go down that conspiracy now, you, path. You remember Justin. when Apple did that, right? That was like, and ever since then, yeah. I feel like that's like a move that everybody does where they, they do something and they act like it's really bad. Yeah. But it was something they totally allowed no, just that's to true. get the press. That's totally true. Yeah. Companies have done that on purpose yeah. in the past. Yeah. yeah. So I. I, I just think, and maybe it was like one employee. Yeah, that's like what I'm two saying. Employees. That's, I think it's a handful of employees, but mm -hmm. and they probably triggered someone like, "Ooh, this is actually." Hey, a hey good let's make yeah, this public. Uh... Yeah, number one, get us more attention. Number two, to embarrass these stupid employees that want to yeah. <laughs> walk out <laughs> over this. No, know? I think it's yeah. a it's a brilliant. I mean, look at how much that's been on the headlines for the last week. I mean, that's everybody is talking about. Yeah, that. I know, and Spotify's in, in a they would would a terrible terrible uh, position to be in if they were to allow those employees to dictate that policy. Right. Yeah. That would ruin the no company. No control over your company. Right. Oh man. That so would... so I think like nothing is happening. They're just they're just put leaking the information out so it'll go go viral and people will be talking about it. Yeah. So yeah. that's very plausible. Sometimes yeah. I think back though, some so because you're probably right, Adam, <laughs> that might be the case. But sometimes I think back to like when I first got my first like big job working as a trainer, you know, 1997, 98, like it was different in those days, the things that bosses said to their employees. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't imagine. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, could you, listen, think about this. Could yeah, you imagine different. when we first started in the fitness, in our bit, you know, working, right? Where you and two other trainers got together and you're like, let's go, let's go talk to the general manager right yeah. now. Here's our list of demands. Yeah. We are not, <laughs> we are not here to clean equipment, yeah. you know? Yeah. We're oh. not going to do that. We're just trainers. Yeah. Oh my! The guy just literally like rips your list in front of you and then like <clears throat> pees on it. You know? Yeah, you would, <laughs> dude, you would have been. been hammered. I was in a sales meeting one time. This is a true story. I was in a sales meeting one time, and the man and my manager, who was super angry with the fact that you know some guys were just being lazy and not getting leads, threw a calculator like a ninja star. Yeah. In between two of them, into the wall. That's what happened in the meeting, <laughs> and that's like the one that I'll tell on the podcast. I have many other stories. Hey, now that yeah. being said, though, uh, my first promotion came from uh, so one of my one of my like rivals. So a guy that uh, I actually worked with. I've told the story of like who like the top trainer was in in our our gym when I was twenty, first coming in. He got promoted like a year or two before me. Him and I used to butt heads. And so we became like this rival. He gets promoted uh, first to the club that I'm in. <clears throat> so he's my boss for a small, uh, short window. Then he gets promoted up to the Hillsdale location, which you're familiar with, Sal. And I then get promoted to the, the, the gym that I'm currently in and his old position. So I'm now running the staff that he was running right before that. So my competitive nature is to outperform the numbers that he ever did out of there, which we did. And he's now running one of the bigger boxes, Hillsdale in the Bay Area. And he was there for about a year, and I got the call to come work there. And the way, the way I got that position was because 20 of his 22 trainers got together and went up to the corporate office and said they were all quitting if they didn't get rid of him. Wow. So the power of the mob sometimes does work because they quickly- Now, you inherited them. Yeah. Did you end up firing them all? No, I didn't. Oh wow! No, I actually, I mean, I, I would, <clears throat> I turned. I, I would have slowly. That fired wasn't them. so. That what that lesson for me didn't come until a little bit later, uh, where I I learned quickly that, you know, I could always come into a team, inherit another buddy, a, another person's team, and kind of win you over uh, initially and and outperform you. And because I was a speed of the leader guy, where I wrote a lot of revenue as a as a fitness manager, which was rare back in those days. 
um, I could elevate the club and the team right away. And so I could come in within a, a month or two, we would turn it around. We'd already be outperforming the, the prior person. But over time, those people that were not my people would eventually have to go. They would eventually kind of wear it. And there's always outliers, right? There's always somebody who's a team player or adopted to my style more and then be mm -hmm. kind of became my guy or my girl. Uh, but eventually, most uh, everybody who worked for the person before, and it's just, that's kind of like a rule. Like when you inherit staff, like you have to like clean out the people before, cause especially if you lead differently, if you lead differently and have different philosophies and, yeah. So yeah, eventually I had to get rid of all of them, but yeah. not initially. I yeah, I would. I when I would get into a new place, I, <laughs> I I would almost always there was always one person or maybe two people that you had to you had to make an example. What I mean by that is you had to show everybody else that uh, this is how it's going to be. Yeah, Otherwise, right. it's like <laughs> no bad seeds. Yeah, I mean, I had a I, I had the first club I ran. I had a guy who'd been <clears throat> in the company for I don't know forever since the beginning. And he just decided, uh, first off, the way he would talk to me was a little condescending, slightly, and I mm -hmm. could sense it. Mm -hmm. And he decided he was supposed to run the weekend, supposed to show up at work at 9 a.m. Didn't show up. It was 9.30, 10 a.m., 10.30. So I drove to work an hour away to the club. He walks in at noon. And I handed him his stuff in his deck was in his desk, and I said, "You're fired." Well, you gotta yeah. you gotta understand that, like, uh, and people like when I give this advice to other you know uh, managers or leaders that inherit staff, and I always say, I say the same thing that you just alluded to, which is you know fire them all, all right? Fire them all, get your own people. The truth is that it's like a, especially in the fitness space where you you build this really strong bond with your your staff, and it's like a family. You know, if you hired, trained, and developed these people, and then you move along, and then the next person comes in, you're like the adopted parent. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, and that kid is you're the a, new guy. Yeah, there. And a it mini, takes a while for them to really buy into you. Oh, totally. And you, and that's if they ever do, because many right. times you run your you run your box different than the other person does. Well, and, a lot of the people there are, are probably going to be open minded, but some yeah. people are just not. Mm -hmm. And they become a cancer, yeah. and that's the ones that you have to identify well, right away. I saw that a lot in sports, and especially in team sports. So, like going through various programs, like I have seen guys that just really had their own in, like self interests in mind, and would start to vocalize that. And it was interesting for me to see how the head coach was going to deal with this because this is one of those pivotal moments where it's going to affect everybody because i've had both reactions i've had one where the coach went you know guns blazing thunderous like took a desk and, and smashed it against the wall and was like you're out of here you're never coming back you know dealt with the parents all the ramifications of that and just like you're out and we all had a great season after that <laughs> and now you know and then and then on the other end of it it was like pure dissension. We we started our, our our performance, you know, as a group all went down. Everybody went down. We had like the worst year we've ever had, and it's because of like the start of that one person yeah. that that spread out to everybody else in this negative bullshit. It's yeah. a hard lesson that you have to learn as a leader, and I remember it being challenging when it's uh, top performing people that you have to get rid of. That's a, that's the part that's scary. If you come in, you inherit a team, and yep. it's your star quarterback or it's your star producer, and they're the one that could be the cancer to the to the team. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really tough decision to do that. And I know a lot of uh, a lot of leaders that get stuck in that position, and oh, they feel like they're held hostage. Yes, yeah. and it's you know maybe initially it's 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 tougher to get rid of that person and then rebuild, but you're always better off having somebody bought into your vision that's less talented yes. than somebody more talented. Who who was constantly bucking a you the cohesive a cohesive team made up of average people is always going to outperform a team that is not cohesive that's made up of, of a bunch of superstars who don't care about the team and want to do their own thing right mm -hmm. right the mm -hmm. team with the average people who work together will always outperform this is true in sports this is also true in every gym I've ever managed, every sales staff I've ever had, every fitness yeah. uh, staff Any I've ever had. Any business that has a culture. 100%. Uh, dude, did you guys see uh, Larry Wheels, his last video? No. One of his last videos? No, no. 250-pound dumbbells, incline presses, smooth, 12 reps. Yeah. I can't even believe how strong he is. Yeah. Just it doesn't still make, moving weight. Like he got nothing. these specially made dumbbells that they had to make spe specifically for him, brings them up, and does incline presses. Like with no, them, like nothing. That guy is just—he's young too, isn't he? He's so strong; it doesn't make any. Isn't sense. Isn't he like mid twenties? I don't know. 
Yeah, he's 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 in his mid twenties. He's not. I see even... our new uh, YouTube host uh, ripping what six seventy five. Yeah. Oh, dude, Marlon. Yes. Yeah, Marlon. Dad, bro, he almost had seven hundred. He had seven hundred. It slipped out of his hands. Now Na- he's all natural. He's yeah. built. You could tell he's natural. He's got a good physique, but he's a natural dude. But insane strength. Yeah, yeah. no. Like incredible six seventy five. Yeah, no, he's like, gonna man, pull seven hundred. I, had... I messaged him. I'm like, you can't be stronger than me and be on our. YouTube. I, no, I, 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 <laughs> did you see Sorry. my post underneath it? That's no, exactly. yeah. after his six. He did a six seventy five. Oh, we're gonna take all your videos down say, now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you can't, you can't, can't work for my TV anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. Too strong, dude. Yeah, too strong. Once for you, him. once you've passed this up. Yeah, yeah, yeah Hey, can. remember? You know how we were speculating on what's that guy who won in the UFC? I didn't. What's his last name? Adisana. Adi, uh, Adisanya. The, the style bender. Yes. Yeah, style his bender. Uh, his gynecomastia. Yeah. So apparently, a lot of people were speculating. Finally, about it. it took a while for people to say anything. Oh, it was bad. I saw it right away. Oh yeah. Yeah, right away. But uh, he came out and talked about it. Really? Yeah. What What's he, he claim? He says, I don't know what it is. We're going to go get it checked out. <laughs> That's literally what he said, dude. Great response. Bull shit. I know. Yeah. That uh, happens. Uh, either you it's have- It's weird. I'm lactating. I don't know what's happening. Yeah, yeah. dude. If you're in a- Look, that happens in teenage boys sometimes from the, the changing in testosterone. Bro, not from a fucking primo athlete that should not have- Not that his, age. No. no not, that's, that's, that's testosterone or steroid abuse. Yes, yeah. I know I saw uh, Dolce. I, I listened to his recap. I, unfortunately, he was too politically correct for me to enjoy it. It was just like- <laughs> I'm like, come on, guy. Like, the, yeah. If you're going to do a clickbait thing like that for me to watch, like, give me yeah. like your- Point it out. Yeah. Yeah, like, it, it may mean this. It may mean that I'm like, everybody's afraid to just say it. Like, dude, say what it is. Like, that shit is for sure. This dude is taking something, dude. There's You're no- not getting that naturally unless you have like really bad hormone issues as a man. Yeah. Mm. In which case, uh, yeah, definitely get it checked out. And, and that's not yeah. happening in that type of No, an and if, if he's training at that level and it's happening and he's got coaches and doctors and it's not steroids, you better believe they're going to say, hey, well, we need to go get it checked out. how does that get through? Because they have some of the most rigorous like drug testing on, possible. Dude. They're on. not, though. Remember when we it, talked to John Ramon? It's the timing of it. It right? is. The it's cycle. all about timing. It's there's, cat and mouse, dude. They yeah. they understand and, the testing and, and when they there's, figure out. Exactly. When there's that much money in these sports, I mean, this is, uh, this is like this ongoing debate I always have with my friends who like just, they want to believe that professional sports is mostly clean and there's these few outliers that get caught. Yeah, it's like, I've released that. It's thought. the completely opposite. It's like most everybody is using yeah. and doing it and they're and they're and they're doing it in ways that they cannot so they don't get caught. Now to be and clear, the reality is yes. people like Brendan are like those are anomalies. Like mm-hmm. the, you rarely meet somebody like him who's played eight years in the NFL and was clean and didn't do it. Like that that's not and, normal. And to be clear, that's not why they're professionals. I think a lot of people think no, oh, of course no, definitely the, the not. Trying to like, like, elongate their careers. No, most like of the time. here's the truth: you get a professional athlete at that level, and you have them stay natural, and then you get the average person, and you put them on all the drugs you want. We'll never do it. You won't even come close. No, what no, I look at gonna, it like: so, like yeah, Brendan, Brendan was a was a, a very very good NFL player. I think if you put him on drugs, he could have been great. Like he was already good. Like he was already a really good player. But for the average, he wasn't like a household name for everybody. He wasn't a Ray Lewis. Mm. You put somebody who is naturally that talented, that gifted, with that work ethic, that made it to that level all natural. Then you throw steroids on him, and then he becomes like. At the very least, it might have given him more longevity. You can continue to play at that level, you know, at, a, at an older take a age. Beating, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but yeah, no, for sure. It's you don't such get a brutal sport. You don't get gyno as an adult unless a couple things are going really wrong, or you're on you messing with. And that was steroids. a that's a that's a that was a bad one. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're, dude. so you really the hormones swung pretty hard on that yes. for you to have not have it at all and then to go there like and somebody who's experienced it like so I I've battled gynecomastia from steroid use myself and you know it, to get it to even be visual for the average person like you have to really be well you know what the problem is hmm. the problem is the drugs that you use to control those kinds of side effects so let's say you're on steroids right and you're doing hormone stuff and you start to develop breast tissue because what ends up happening is once you get your testosterone to a certain level or you take ster- anabolics... The, the that, estrogen wants to try and keep up with well, it. Well, not just... It gets converted. Yeah. Your, your body wants to convert extra testosterone or extra steroid into estrogen um, or prolactin, for example, and so you start to develop breast tissue. The way to control it is with drugs that reduce the conversion of testosterone to estrogen. Those are called anti-aromatase uh, drugs. Or you take drugs that block the estrogen receptor. Here's the problem. Those drugs are the easiest to catch on the test. Mm. 
So if you go into this to the to the fight, yeah, right. and you've got you're getting gyno, and you can control the anabolics so that they won't catch you. Mm. You can't take those other drugs because they stay in your system. Well, and they're easy to detect. That's how most like who was was it uh, who's it Manny Ramirez in the uh, MLB that well, a few years back they got caught with that. Like they, it's normally it is normally like it's the, the anti estrogen. It's normally the blockers. With. They run the cycle correctly to where you know they know like okay this is off season I can take all these steroids if as long as I shut them down by this date mm -hmm. then it won't come up on the test. But then all of a sudden you start getting these side effects when if you didn't come off perfectly and then you have the option, okay, do I take these things and keep myself from growing fucking breast or making sure that I balance out my hormones or do I ride it out and just say fuck it because I'm going to get tested again and that's going to get flagged. Yep. Yeah. And so, yeah, he had to have been in that predicament and it's like, well, I guess I just got to roll with this thing until I <laughs> I don't know, dude. If I was, I don't remember the guy who fought him, but if I was that guy and I saw that big old guy, I'd be, I would be here. pinching that thing. Oh. <laughs> you know how painful that would be? Yeah, but you know, it's like the, 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 the getting the clinch. The <laughs> kettle calling <laughs> the pot black though. You know what I'm saying? You got, I mean, you can't tell me that fool is look how yeah but he don't got guy he looks like because yeah, he just balances his drugs nah, better that's dude. it <laughs> you just keep flicking it yeah. oh I, I don't know oh, how wow. i don't know how that i don't know how anybody watches that and doesn't look at that dude and go like this dude's on has been yeah, on. how do you look like an amateur bodybuilder yeah dude at that level? you don't look like i mean you do, that that's definitely some. i don't know though i will say this dude i have definitely known i've only known a few people like this with genetics that you think to yourself this person is definitely part human part something else yeah that's fair I've met people that's, like that's that. That's why, too. Like, I mean, we could, I'm speculating, right? So I don't know any facts. So, you know, a retract is saying guaranteed anything, right? I like, always think back to this guy. Because I have been wrong enough times to yes. know on both ways, right? There's been guys that I said, like, for sure is on steroids. He's absolutely not. And then there's yeah. other people like, oh, no, he's definitely not. And then he totally Dude, is. Dude, so. I, I worked with a guy that, and I knew because he would just share with me. This guy was on so many steroids. And if you looked at him, you would think to yourself, maybe he works out. That's about as, that's how far his body got with all these drugs mm. and then i had this one guy that worked for me and i love i eventually convinced him to become a trainer didn't make much money at all because he was a front desk at night and then a porter during the day great dude very nice guy every once in a while i'd buy him lunch because i noticed he he walked to work didn't have any money he would eat uh, no joke his breakfast would be a either a muffin if we had free muffins at the front desk for the staff he'd ask me hey how can i have a muffin that's his breakfast his lunch would consist of Oh, McDonald's has 99 cents cheeseburgers. I'm going to go eat one of them. <sighs> Dinner was SpaghettiOs. And he'd go in the gym and do skull crushers with 225 like it was warming up. And I remember seeing this guy going, this is, uh, holy cow, that's some genetics yeah. right there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, really quick. Hey, there's a study circulating right now. I want to, um, it's starting to make waves in the, in the fitness space on, at least on Instagram. It's a study on fasting. Oh, I heard this. Intermittent fasting. Oh, I love studies like this. The, 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 that it could build muscle? No, lose muscle. So oh, they, lose muscle. So they took they took a couple groups. One group didn't fast. The other group fasted. <laughs> and the group that fasted lost weight, and the group that didn't fast didn't lose weight. They go in, do the analysis, and find that the weight that they lost was muscle. So you're getting all these people now that are like, fasting causes muscle loss, and mm -hmm. fasting is not good, and blah, 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 blah. Look, you got to look at the study. Nothing was controlled. It was literally you eat whatever you want, eat three meals a day plus snacks. You eat whatever you want, but make sure you eat within an eight hour window. There was nothing controlled. So, literally, oh, oh God, literally, it was you probably are eating less calories, less protein. We know you're not working out. You over here, you're probably consuming more protein, a little bit more. Of course, you're going to lose muscle. Yes. Of course, you are Dude, with something like that. That sounds pretty worthless to me. That's the, That was the study. So right now, people wow. are- Now, are there trainers that are touting it right now that like are anti-fasting people? Yes. Oh, there is. Yeah. Oh, oh you, know, you this look is, silly. Yeah. No, it's not Don't the fasting. Look silly. Well, not to mention, by the way, which I think since day one, regardless if that study did prove that or not- is we've talked about that this, this should not be used as a tool for fat loss, building muscle, losing none of that. It's a health yeah. tool. It's yeah, a, it's a it's, it's a good. relationship tool with your food, right? Yes. So it's not a performance hack. Exactly. Many people struggle with their relationship with food. We've we've advocated for fasting as a great tool to help work on that relationship because it is something that very few of us have ever decided. Hey, I'm not going to eat for 24 or 48 hours and actually stick to it. So you can actually really see like, oh, was I hungry or was that real cravings and you don't realize that until you actually resist from food for a long period of time like that it's not a great strategy to lose body fat or build muscle correct. it's just silly correct yeah. uh hey how did, what did you guys think of your pump, pumpkin spice 
Lattes. Dude, delicious. Yes. Oh, my God. So this is the season, you never right? I thought it was going to be. This is the season for pumpkin spice latte. So what I did yeah. is I had- uh, Jerry made it with coffee, I right? So I messaged her yesterday. Bitch. Oh, it was you who did that. Yes. So I experimented with this at home. So uh, Organifi makes this gold juice, which is you take it at night because in the gold juice they have adaptogenic substances like uh, reishi, turkey tail, ashwagandha, good for relaxing- uh, that's why it's good at night. They've got these kind of balancing effects, but it tastes like it's a really tasty uh, drink. It tastes like pumpkin spice. So I thought, why not mix this with, uh, co- what is it, uh, almond milk and coffee because pumpkin spice lattes are like the thing right now. We're getting yeah. to the season. Right. So I told Jerry, he said, make those for the guys tomorrow. And so you guys liked them. Oh, pumpkin spice and everything nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So here's what's, here's what's superior. To, so I was this, wondering why Justin was wearing his Uggs this morning. <laughs> Ooh, my scarf. <laughs> yeah. All sweaty, no yeah. socks in there. Yeah. Yeah. Gross. <laughs> so here's the thing that they're superior to the pumpkin spice lattes you'll buy at the at Starbucks or whatever because the gold juice has uh, oh, yeah. almost no sugar in it. So you're not putting sugar or whatever sweeteners. It's got the balancing herbs, and it's a great combination with caffeine from coffee. Right. Because now you get the buzz from ca- the caffeine. Yeah. It cuts that like super high jittery type of, type of a caffeine high, and it just you know evens it out and elongates it. So it's a low calorie latte that is it gives you a great uh, mental and physical effect from the balancing effect of the caffeine, yeah. the ashwagandha, and all the other stuff. No, that's I in really it. enjoyed it. it was and great. the gold juice, yeah. First question is from Tiffany J. Little. When I go on vacation or take a week off exercise and ease up slightly on nutrition, I lose weight, my digestion is better, and I sleep great. Why is this, and how do I go back to my everyday life and continue the positive momentum? I love this question, and this is an observation that I've had many clients report to me. I have myself identified this uh, at times, where I go on vacation and foods that normally would cause gut issues don't necessarily cause gut issues. Sleep issues seem to disappear. Doesn't this um, speak really to your stress levels? Totally. Yeah. This is a, people don't realize just how big of an effect your stress has uh, on your body's ability to build muscle, burn body fat, your cravings, your sleep, your hormones. Digestion. Everything yep. is affected so strongly from these things. And this is why you go on vacation and you're like, wow, I've got the best sleep. I can't believe I feel so good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've had some of my best workouts uh, on vacation, uh, which you know is, is strange because my diet isn't necessarily as good. Um, you'll find that when you're stressed, here's another thing, if you're not tracking – you know, you may not realize this, but when you're under a lot of stress, they've proven this in, in many studies. And again, this is my own observation with clients. You crave foods that tend to not be as good for you as well. You tend to eat more oh, yeah. when you're stressed out. Uh, and of course, sleep is is totally negatively affected, you know? Yeah, it is. I've definitely noticed this myself too. Like going on vacation, you're just immediately this weight is like, like relieved and and your body just feels like, Oh, you know, I can, I can, uh, provide you more energy. I can provide you like more strength. My workouts are better. It's just like the, there's less of that pressure and tension, like leading into that, like, Oh, I got to get this in and cram it into my already hectic and chaotic schedule. It's just, it's one of those things you you try and think about that and then kind of carry that into, well, well, what do I got to do now? You know, recovery wise, and what do I got to implement now? Like coming back out of vacation to, you know, get these same types of feels. Well, this is, you know, this is interesting. This is a question. And we were talking about that study, Sal, that you brought up with intermittent fasting. This is an example of somebody that I use this tool for. You know, this sometimes is a sign to me like, oh, this person is like stressing about what they're eating. They're, they're, they, have, they have this structure that they're following. They probably got a lot of stress at work. They're also hammering the weights like crazy. You know, this is somebody I might say, okay, hey, once a week, we're going to do, you know, a fast. And at, during that time, I want you to do something meditative. I want you to do either yoga. I want you to do sauna stuff or cold plunge, hot, cold stuff, like focus on kind of working within and restrict from food for the day and not think about it. Right. Yeah. And so this is somebody who I might do that with and use that as a tool because that's normally a sign of like, yeah, you are, you're just probably stressing too much mm-hmm. over all those things. And you just naturally going on vacation, probably eating just when you're hungry. You're probably doing things with your family and friends and focusing on other aspects yeah, of your you're life. Probably even more active. You're getting more sleep, you get more sun, yeah. you know, cause usually on vacation, you're going somewhere where there's more sun. 
Yep. Uh, and, and yeah, and your interactions are are less like stressful and chaotic with people. It's it's like a whole factor of things. Yeah, I've had clients uh, lose body fat and get stronger simply from incorporating a some kind of a a relaxation or you know meditative or stress management technique into their lives. Literally, from just adding. 10 minutes of meditation a day or prayer or I've had clients actually, no joke. This is, this is, this has happened several times where I'll have a client reduce their activity and replace it with something that's more uh, rejuvenating or, or somebody maybe was doing a spin class. For example, I had a client do this once we replaced the spin class with a yin yoga class. Now for all intents and purpose of and purposes, she was burning more calories with the spin class than they were with the yoga class. But the result was they actually got leaner. And it, I remember it blowing them away and it, it really did highlight just how much of an impact stress makes on your body. I've had clients who deal with chronic pain and they'll hire me and we'll do corrective exercise and I'll work with the chiropractor and their physical therapist and imaging shows that they probably shouldn't have any pain. And we got rid of a lot of it, but for some reason there's still some pain present. And then they'll go on vacation and they'll come back and be like, my back pain was gone while I was on vacation and it's starting to come back again. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, this is a stress thing yeah, yeah. that's happening to you. I mean, studies will show that that you know, antidepressants sometimes will get somebody's pain uh, to go down as well. So there's so much that your stress level and perception of your life, um, it's so impactful in your life that if you are putting together a – a routine, a health routine, and you're considering your exercise, your diet, your sleep, you should also consider your perception. You also should consider some kind of a spiritual practice or something that will help you manage stress because it's almost it's just as important as those other factors. Next question is from a long life site. What priming moves are good for squats, deadlifts, bench press, and the other big lifts? Well, first of all, the best priming movements are going to be the ones that are uh, specific to specific you. To you. Yeah. So individualized priming movements are superior to non, uh, you know, non-specific priming movements for your body. This is why when we wrote MAPS Prime, uh, we put in MAPS Prime a self-assessment tool because we know this as trainers. We know yeah. we can put general priming movements out there. But if you if the general priming priming movement is the opposite of what you need, not only is it going to not help you, it might actually make things worse. Well, let's let's give an example of this, right? Let's so let's take the very first one, squats, and I'll give you three different priming movements for three different people based off of what I see in their movement. So if somebody has their their knees uh, collapse in every time they squat. I'm going to do something like tube walking as like a primer before they they get into their squats because this is an issue that they they're battling and so us priming with that exercise first is probably going to benefit them the most in this squat. Let's say I have uh, another client who has a hard time feeling it in squats in their glutes and they're very quad dominant and they're they're feeling more in their hip flexors and their quads when they do squats and they are their glutes. I might do floor bridges with this person to prime their glutes so their glutes are firing better when they do a squat. Let's take my third client. My third client who has uh, is an engineer and he's on the computer and stuff all day long and he has excessive forward shoulders and forward head. And so I'm going to prime him with like zone one from Maps Prime and really work on his- The wall test. Yeah, the wall test because he's he's fully, he's rounding forward so much when he squats, he's feeling it in his knees and in his quads because of his upper body is rounded so forward. So I'm going to prime that before squatting. So that's, you know- there's one exercise, but three different people, how I would prime them differently going into that single exercise. Yeah, and to take mm -hmm. it even a step further, the example that you gave, Adam, of the person whose knees collapse in and you have them do tube walking, let's say you had a, a client, and this is less common, but this will happen. This can happen. Let's say you have a client whose knees go too far out when they squat. I've had mm -hmm. this happen with dancers where yep. they Me literally, their, their knees bow, bow out mm -hmm. uh, in the opposite direction. Two blocking not only would be the wrong priming movement for them, it would be it would make that worse. Yeah, with reinforce that the bad pattern. It would reinforce the bad pattern. So individualizing your priming is what you really want to do. Um, and we have, by the way, we have a free webinar where you'll learn some of these self assessment tools and some priming. It's mapsprime.com. I highly recommend you go there. But what I do, what I will do, is this on the podcast. I will give you some general 
priming movements for some of those uh, exercises based off of what I notice in a majority of people uh, that I work with. So with squatting, you know, your general priming movements that tend to be really good for most people would be your combat stretch. Uh, 90-90 mm -hmm. tends to be really good. And some kind of a prone cobra or a band row for the upper uh, back to pull the shoulders back. So generally speaking, that works for a lot of people. Uh, the deadlift, I love priming people with a, a single leg uh, toe touch. Mm, a windmill. Uh, windmill is, is great. excellent for deadlifts as well. For a bench press, I tend to do something that involves a row or pulling the shoulders back for priming there. And then for an overhead press, uh, a wall press tends to work great for a lot of people. But again, if it's opposite of what your individual body needs, not only will those priming movements not help you, they may actually make things a little bit worse uh, for you. So, and again, in our MAPS Prime program, it's very specific. Like we, you go in there, you take a test based off of how you do with the test, it points you in the right direction. So you can do exercises that are best for your body. But I tell you what, there is no, there's no comparison to priming your body properly. The feeling you get when you go into an exercise. And you feel it immediately. Right away. Yeah. Well, right away. And it's so important you go through that to find out for yourself like what those deviations are because the closer you get to alignment and, and stacking your spine and everything to be, you know, the maximize the the optimal uh, range of motion, uh, the better your overall performance is going to be in all these lifts. So to do that yourself is is imperative. Next question is from Grant Satters. So wait, are kettlebells superior to dumbbells? Justin would think so. <laughs> what? Uh, it depends. It, it yeah. depends what we're talking about, what exercise, and the person. They're both excellent tools. They're both free weights. I would say dumbbells <sighs> probably are a little bit more versatile. Yeah. But here's the big difference between them. Um, kettlebell, the placement of the weight changes the feel of the exercise, and it changes the length of the lever. So, like, if I'm doing a kettlebell swing, yeah. the lever is longer, the weight is at Ballistic the very end. Ballistic moves and, and, like, power moves, I prefer kettlebell all day. Just yeah. because of the way, yeah, like, it's it, it's set up uh, with the load. Um, but, I mean, they're, they're totally different approaches. And I think that there's crossover because, obviously, you can do, like, you know, shoulder presses. You can do rows. You can do a lot of similar things as, as the dumbbells. Um, but they have their own unique characteristics. And I do love uh, the, the way kettlebells feel, especially like in the rack position. And, uh, you know, I could, I could keep them pretty, uh, pretty much in the center of my body, which feels like I have more control. Uh, but it, honestly, it takes a little bit more education and technique uh, to be able to use the kettlebells properly. So I think that's a bit of a disadvantage uh, for kettlebells for your average person. There is like sort of that learning curve. Uh, that's a little more difficult, but once you get through that, you realize the the capability of kettlebells. There's it's it's almost like open ended. There's just so many different ways that you can apply that to movement and and load uh, your body through exercises. Well, I think you said it best at first, which is that it's kettlebells are superior for dynamic ballistic movements, so explosive type stuff, right? Yeah. So your swings, your snatches, you do things like that with kettlebells. And I think it's far more effective. It's than, more smooth. And yeah. Fluid. Then, yeah. Then doing it with dumbbells. Uh, but to like Sal's point, dumbbells are probably more versatile for the average person just that's trying to exercise. So, you know, I, I don't know. I think, I think both have their value. I think both belong in somewhat of your routine. Uh, I don't think you should avoid either one of them. And I think they both should be included. I, we always get questions where it's like this or that, you know, which is, which is better. And both. Yeah, yeah. And when we talk about training, we, we encourage people to move in and out of all modalities and tools. Like that's the beauty of all these things is learning how to use all of them. And if you've never used kettlebells before, there's a t tremendous amount of value to learn how to use them. Just the learning curve alone, you're going to get a lot of benefits just from learning how to use the kettlebells. And if you only use kettlebells, you're missing out on some things that you could be using the dumbbells for. So I think they both belong in people's programs. Yeah, one of the, one of the I would say one of the advantages of the kettlebell is your ability to lengthen or shorten the lever. So what I mean by the lever is when I'm doing an exercise with my arms, that is a lever. And, if, and a dumbbell places the weight on both sides of my hand. So the weight is at the end of that length of a lever. Now with a kettlebell... I can either put the kettlebell in front of my hand, 
like I'm doing a swing, for example, now the lever is longer. And if you know anything about levers, a longer lever creates more, more tension, resistance. more resistance. It creates more force. A shorter lever has less force, maybe more stability. So I can shorten the lever with a, with a kettlebell too. When I do a kettlebell shoulder press, the kettlebell is sitting on my forearm. And so I've actually shortened the lever with a kettlebell press. Now, what, what that's superior for something like, if I were to compare like an Arnold press with a dumbbell, which is with a rotating dumbbell, right. that in my opinion is superior. It's it's superior to use a kettlebell for that. Yeah, because that's the, way more clunky. It's yeah, the kettlebell is on my arm. It's a shortened lever. Mm -hmm. it, it feels more stable. The rotating feels a little bit better. So I would rather use a kettlebell for that. If I'm doing like mm -hmm. a sumo squat with a client or myself, normally what I'd have to do with a dumbbell is turn it so that the, it, the it's you know uh, vertical hold it by the bell, way better to hold a kettlebell uh, in that position. When I'm doing flies, if you want to have stability, dumbbells are better. If you want to change the lever so that maybe it creates a little more tension, try doing flies with kettlebells. Now when you're going down, the weight is behind your arm, creates a different tension pull. I think the key here is to know that they're both great Use them both. Uh, you can do complete workouts with either one, but if you want the best results, you're going to incorporate uh, a little of each. Next question is from Train with Faye. What was it like as a new trainer? How did you get your first real client? I'm new to personal training and I know I'm capable of helping others. However, I'm also aware that I'm experiencing a bit of imposter syndrome. What are tips to help you navigate the landscape with honesty and confidence? And without turning away clients. This is still like really vivid for me. Do you guys, were, I mean, I, I oh, rem dude, I, like yeah. yesterday. Mm -hmm. I, re I remember this feeling. I remember my very first client, my first deal, all that stuff. Um, and then I also remember transitioning into leading trainers for most of my career and seeing what they, many of them struggled with. And the imposter syndrome thing is like super common, especially mm -hmm. when you're learning, right? You're just learning all these, all this different stuff with nutrition and mechanics and program design. And, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot at first and you're young and you're, and then you're getting on, I, I would get, be getting these clients that are brilliant people, doctors and engineers. <laughs> they and ask what, you a lot of questions. Yeah. And they're very intelligent and they're asking you a lot of questions that you feel, damn, I don't know a lot of these answers. I think, uh, one, uh, a common mistake is trying to pretend uh, like you know more than what you do. I mean, you, there's nothing wrong with saying like, I don't know, but I will find out for you by tomorrow or by the time I see you on your next session or let me look into that or I'm not sure. Like, like just get comfortable with saying things like that. I think people appreciate that. It reminds me like a, of uh, the first time you're, you sit in a restaurant and you have a, a waiter or a waitress mm -hmm. that has uh, never, never done this before. They don't know the menu. It's their for you're, you're one of their first customers. And they don't announce it. And they don't the announce it. Yes. Right. They don't announce it versus announcing it. If they announce it and they tell me like, hey, uh, I just want you to know today's my first day or my first week. I'm learning the menu still. Like mm -hmm. all of a sudden, instantly, I have, I have a lot more patience. Doesn't mean I'm not going to want my food served by them. No. Oh, we can't eat here now because you're brand new. Like, no, I'm here. And now I have more patience that you're learning, right? So I can appreciate that. Same thing goes for training. Like if you're a trainer and you're trying to pretend like you know and you don't know, that comes off worse than just yeah. coming straight forward and being like, oh, I don't, I don't know these things. The other piece is the things that you do know. Stick to teaching that. Yeah. I I was this, I was this core guy, right? That was my thing when I first started. I I didn't know anything about the transverse abdominis. I didn't know how many muscles it incorporated. I didn't know how important it was to training it. I didn't know how to train it. I didn't know how to teach it to others. And I learned that. That was like one of the first things that I learned as a personal trainer that was new to me. I mean, I understood protein, carbs, and fat. I understood basic exercise science. Like I got that the basics kind of an anatomy for somewhat, but the core was like this new thing for me. Like there, that was un, that was uncharted territory for me. And I knew that, wow, a majority of other average people that aren't into fitness, this has to be new to them too. And so I took that one thing that I knew really well, and that was what I taught or incorporated like with everybody. Like that was my main messaging was, this is what I have to give. I've learned this. This was new to me. It's very valuable information. Can I, and I'll teach it to everybody I know. So I would stick to talking a lot about the things that I, I felt confident in when I, we would address things that I felt less confident in. I would admit, I don't, I'm not sure. Let me check or let me ask, and then I'll get back to you. And you build on that. And I think that's why experience is so important is you can't be afraid to be that person. And you go every time I, I'd have a session and almost always, 
uh, there was something that I would, after that session, I'd be back home researching it, yeah. you know, trying to learn more about whatever we were talking about. Yeah, I remember my first day, like, so vividly. I, I walked in uh, to the gym. Um, I had been working out for a while, and I went up to the front desk. This is how I got hired. I walked up to the front desk, and I'm like, uh, can I talk? To, I'd like to talk to your manager. And, and, and Okay, let me bring him out, and uh, I'd like to work here. I want to be a trainer. And they're like, okay, well, why do you want to be a trainer? And I did this five-minute whatever, and uh, they hired me. I walked in the next day, and that first day I got, I don't know how many clients I got uh, to hire me, but it was it was quite a bit. I, I had outperformed the top trainer in that day or the next day uh, than they had done the whole month. And so for me, my experience was passion, confidence, and it really wasn't that I thought I knew everything. It was that I really wanted to do this and help people. Right. So I need to get clients in order to do this. Now, my experience training trainers or having trainers work for me was a little different. When, the, when I would hire a trainer, what this question is talking about is quite uh, common. And the way it would show up is like this. They usually weren't self-aware enough to say, I feel like an imposter. Usually what, it's, what they would say is, I feel funny asking for this money from a person, is what it was. Like, oh man, I got to ask them for you know, $1,000 you know, for 20 sessions. Mm. That's, that's a lot of money. I don't know if I can ask for that much money. And what that would tell me, and I remember hearing that going- yeah. What They'd you, say like I wouldn't pay for that. Yeah, like, they always like you know bring it back to themselves. Like if I was you know coming, well they're not you. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't pay that much. And I remember yeah. hearing that the first time, going, "What do you mean? You, you know that's hard for you to ask for." And I and then it dawned on me, this trainer doesn't think that they're valuable enough to ask for money to be paid for their services. And the conversation that I would always ha always have is this: I'd say, look. You know, you, you got your certification, you've been working out yourself for a while, but you're a brand new trainer. 99.9% .9 of the clients that you train, this is a real, this is like, I, I was. this is a true statistic, by the way, at, at least 90%, but probably closer to 99% of the people that you'll train if you work out in a normal gym or you train the average person, you are not going to apply any of your advanced knowledge at all. Yeah. In fact, what you're going to be doing with them because they're the average person is teaching them how to do a squat, teaching them how to stabilize their core, teaching them basic form. When it comes to nutrition, you're going to be talking to them about behaviors to help them eat maybe a little bit better, to care about themselves a little more. They probably don't even know what foods have proteins, carbs, and fats, except for maybe the few that they read in a magazine. And I would tell the trainer, all the knowledge that you have, you're literally going to apply 1% of it on most of your clients. So you know way more than the client does, right. and you actually know enough to help most people. And by the way, don't worry. I know you're new. I'm not going to give you the client that requires some kind of complicated rehab. I'm not going to give you the client that is working with four therapists on food issues. I'll make sure that my advanced trainers get that. You're going to train the average person. You are way more than you're worth way more than what you're charging because what you know is way more than what they know and they're here for your support and your help. So yes, ask for the money and then I would play I would say it this way. It's say, okay. Take yourself out of the picture, okay? No what you what exercise and nutrition can provide anybody take the average person what do you think proper exercise and better nutrition can do for them and then i'd have them make a list well it's going to help them sleep better their their blood pressure will go down they're going to be healthier they're going to feel good they're going to look good better mobility less pain we go down this list and i'd say okay is all of this worth a thousand dollars and then they'd say, well, yeah, it is. I said, well, that's what you can provide so long as they do what you say and they work with you. So you're definitely worth it. And then they go out on the floor and feel much more confident with what they're doing. So I think that's the thing that you need to understand as a, as a new trainer is that the vast majority of people you're going to encounter, you're going to apply the most basic stuff that you know and all the advanced stuff you're not even going to be able to bring up because it's not going to be relevant to that client. Yeah, I can I can definitely identify with uh, this person in terms of like the imposter syndrome and something that I've really had to work on personally in anything that I've done. Like uh, anything that I've done where say I'm traveling across the country, now I'm starting over and having to prove myself and my abilities that I'm already confident in, but nobody else knows what I'm capable of like coming into, you know, a sports program or, you know, my my past trek track record for uh, you know 
how I did in school and I have to prove myself again to all these teachers and have to make all new friends. And, you know, this is all part of that uncomfortableness uh, that a lot of people avoid. And so they never grow. And so this is something that I've, I've realized uh, what the other end of that looks like is, is so much better. It, 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 this is all part of the process. You got to learn to, to enjoy it. Like right now you're, you're, you're learning, you know, you're, you're thrown into the fire. And so for me to be able to kind of move through that, I had to stay busy, man. I had to get reps in. I had to make calls. I had to go on the floor and talk to people. And I was really uncomfortable doing it the entire fucking time. It, it was really like terrifying a lot of times for me. But what helped me a lot was becoming more prepared, coming in with a plan. And, you know, whether or not I use that plan specifically, that just gave me more uh, internal confidence to then, you know, pass on to this person. I read this in a book. And so, therefore, I'm going to try this out. Uh, obviously, I know things that I've done personally in the way that I've trained myself that I've seen to be effective. And I, you know, I led with that. Uh, but then I fine tuned it as I, as I, you know, got better and understood uh, people better with, uh, you know, what they were coming in with and how I could help them specifically, not just apply some formula to them, really start to kind of listen and, and learn how to, to, to tweak and modify, uh, you know, the, the type of service I was, uh, you know, providing uh, my clients. And so education should be something that you are really hungry for now. This is something you need. You need that in your toolbox. I have a hack for you for that too. So you're, if you work in a, in a gym setting, more than likely you have at least five to 15 other trainers that are your peers that you work around. And more than likely, if you're the, the new guy, um, most of them have more experience, possibly more knowledge than you. Uh, you are missing out if you don't every single day have a conversation that you learn from one of your peers. If you do not walk up to Justin and say, hey, Justin, what's your favorite exercise to teach? Or Sal, what was like one of the most, you know, paradigm shattering moments for you in nutrition? Or what do you struggle? What do you do with clients? Like if you're not going and asking your peers how they overcome hurdles, what they have in their, what tools yep. do they have in their toolbox? And every day you're not walking away with a new piece of information that you can now apply to your clientele, you are missing out on such an easy ass hack. And that was, and I, I remember I seeing this in, in, uh, in my team of trainers when I was just a trainer, right? And I was like, this is so funny. Like everybody is so competitive because we're all fishing from the same pond, right? Because we're all working in the same gym. So many trainers look at it as a competitive environment and they don't want to share their secrets and they don't really interact that much with each other. And I was the complete opposite. I was like, I have a little bit of knowledge to share and a little bit of experience to share. I have a lot to learn. I'm going to befriend everybody, share all of the little knowledge that I have and try and gain as much as I possibly can. And so I spent so much time with all of my peers, learning from all of them, sharing with all of them. And over time, that just started to compound. And then before you know, knew it, it wasn't but a year and a half later, mm -hmm. I was all of their bosses because I just picked up, I, my goal was like, okay, I'm going to take the best of Justin. I'm going to take the best of Sal. Like I'm going to learn what has made him successful. I'm going to learn what has made him successful, what's made her successful. And I'm going to emulate that. And I'm going to build that into my, my knowledge, my toolbox and start to apply it to my clients. So if you're not learning something every single day, when you work with a team of people that have been doing this longer than you have, you're already missing out on a real easy hack to get better at your craft. Awesome. 100%. Look, if you're new to Mind Pump, there are many ways to consume all of our content. We provide a lot of information in fitness and health. And of course, there's an entertaining component as well. You can find us on YouTube, Mind Pump TV or Mind Pump Podcast. That's where you can watch the podcast or watch exercise demos. You can go to mindpumpmedia.com. Check out some of our written content. We have blogs, uh, lots of blogs written on different topics. You can also go to mindpumpfree.com, download some of our guides that are much more extensive that can help you out with everything from fat loss to muscle building, mobility, and even being a personal trainer. And finally, you can find all of us on Instagram. You can find Doug, the producer at Mind Pump Doug, Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam already formulated it, you committed to it, you're going to follow through and execute no matter what, or will you go like, you can feel that I'm already going to be really sore from these first eight <laughs> sets, so you stop. Start backing out. 
Yeah, so so here's what happens with that level of awareness, Adam. Mm. <laughs> that doesn't kick in in the middle of the workout.